How's everybody doing today? Sorry it was a little uh, warm in here. We ran out and grabbed some fans and things like that. Uh, we tried to uh, make it as cool as... Uh, sorry, I lost my voice at karaoke last night. I thought I was Ronnie James Dio, but I learned I'm not. Um, uh, we, we ran out and grabbed some fans and stuff, but the humidity was a little bit... Uh, a little bit hot today, so uh, I apologize for that, but you know, we worked around it as best we could. Uh, for those that don't know, Stephen Yen um, was delayed. His, he had a, a flight this morning and then a connecting flight, and the connecting flight was late, but he is here and he uh, is signing overtime in the gallery. But, um, so thanks to him for doing that. He literally got on a plane or he went to the airport at 3 this morning and landed here at 4 in the afternoon. So uh, not fun. So those things you just don't control, I guess. Um, the first six rows that we have up here are for VIP. So uh, we try to leave those open for them. Um, once again, I can tell you that uh, this, this show means more to me than you can possibly imagine. Um, it was founded with the intention of honoring my dad when I was a kid. Uh, my dad took me to, we used to have uh, double features in those days. We had big screens with 40-foot screens and velvet uh, curtains and chandeliers like this and larger hanging in the movie theaters. Nothing at all like the experience is today. Um, and my dad took me to see, and every Saturday or Sunday, we would see Hammer Horror movies with Christopher Lee or Vincent Price, double features. Um, thank you. So the intention of this has always been to, number one, to honor my dad, and to, to number two, share the love of horror films with you know, people that have the like mindset. Um, you know, we've been doing this for, since 2003. The convention uh, world has changed a whole lot since then, um, but it's, it's, uh, it's to the credit of many of the, the stars that come here. We have a couple stars that are here this weekend that attended our very first show and helped us really uh, kick it off the ground and, and take, you know, my passion for, for horror and to share it with people in, in honor of my dad. Um, you know, they helped us tremendously to do that and we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for those people at the first show. And one of them is going to be on stage in this is a couple minutes. So, um, thanks again for coming. I really, really do appreciate it. Your support, you know, show after show, year after year. I used to worry about, you know, how we would do and, you know, if, if people would come. And now it's at the point where, you know, we're, we're selling out and we're trying to not overcrowd the place. We had problems with counterfeit wristbands in the past, which is why you have to scan your wristbands and stuff now. <clears throat> a lot of other things came up and uh, hopefully we fixed most of that, if not all of that. So, uh, and your support, show after show, year after year, really helps us do that. So give yourselves a big round of applause. <laughs> So one of my favorite films was the first Hellraiser movie. In, in my mind, it was the, the closest of modern horror could get to the feeling that I've got years before that when I watched Hammer movies. So uh, from Hellraiser number two, please welcome. Her character was the female Cenobite. I don't know why she didn't get a name, but uh, her character was the female Cenobite. Please welcome a Barbie Wilde. Next up, if you were at the VIP party last night, uh, you saw a man with chocolate all over his face and his hands. He looked like someone that had too many x lacs uh, <laughs> Please welcome Butterball himself, Simon Bamford. And what I mean by that, uh, we had a butterball cake at the party and we had Simon cut the cake. And Simon doesn't cut a cake like a normal person would do. <laughs> <laughs> he wore the cake, so. <laughs> um, also, uh, next up from the very first Hellraiser film, The Chatterer, Nick Vince.
And uh, last but certainly not least, the person who helped make Monster Mania a thing. Um, we had been started, we had all these plans when we were going to do a convention, and my son and I are huge Hellraiser fans, and the first person we both said that we needed to have at our show was Doug Bradley. And if, if, please welcome lead Cenobite, Doug Bradley. So generally what we'll do is uh, we'll throw the questions out to the audience. Um, if you would, just raise your hand. If we call on you, please stand up. I, I, there's two ways that we could do it. We could pass a microphone around, which turns into like uh, an Olympic gymnastic thing when the person in the second row wants to use the microphone and then the person in the 13th row on the right wants to. So the easiest way I think to do it is just if you would raise your hand, if we call on you, if you would, just stand up and uh, throw your question as loud as you can up to the front, and we'll try to repeat it and then answer the question. So who's going to be the brave soul with the first question? Oh, my, here we go. Yes, sir. I have a question for Barbie. Okay. Um, if you could name the female Cenobite, if she you did. have a name, what would her name be? Uh, well, <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's several answers to that question. Mm -hmm. Now, um, in the first film, you'll notice the um, uh, character names uh, were Lead Cenobite, Chattering Cenobite, Fat Cenobite, and Female Cenobite. Was it? Oh! Oh, wow! Oh, wow. <laughs> oh. oh, my God. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Clive Barker. <laughs> thank you, Cliff. thank you very much, Clive. Uh, thank you. Well, I was saying <laughs> before that spectacular entrance that, um, that during the process from one to two, this is what I've heard anyway, that the makeup crew's nicknames were given to the characters. So, uh, lead Cenobite became Pinhead. Chatterer became uh, chattering. Be Cenobite became chatterer. Yeah, poor bastard, A.K. And um, uh, fat Cenobite became Butterball. Now, from what I can understand, the makeup crew's nickname for me, my character, was Deep Throat. <laughs> yeah. So now you may recall, well, <laughs> there, during the same time, there was a rather notorious porno film called Deep Throat. And they, for some reason, the production company felt that this was sort of, considering this is a film with very heavy S&M themes, you know, they thought, oh, this is outrageous. We can't possibly have her call be called that. So I got lumbered with the rather unromantic female Cenobite. But I believe you've got, didn't you have a, um, a nickname for her? Oh, we're not going to talk about that. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, well, I don't want to interrupt. I'm here just to, in case there were scattered questions that, that you guys had not yet addressed or something I could talk about while I run away up in my room. I thought I'd join my merry crew here. Wonderful. Yeah, so. Hey, yeah! But I have one more little thing to add to that. That there was an anthology in two, oh God, I can't remember when it was. Um, and they asked me to write a story. And so taking inspiration from the brilliant original novella on which all the Hellraiser mythology is based, The Hellbound Heart, I wrote a story called Sister Solis. And if you're a Roman Catholic, you'll know the Opus Deis use a Solis around their thigh to remind themselves of Jesus' suffering. And I thought, that's a good name for a Cenobite. So, <laughs> uh, such sweet suffering. So basically, that's, you know, uh, another name maybe for her. It's a little bit, you know, posher than uh, 
uh, deep throat. So. <laughs> okay, right here. So the question to the uh, panel was, what was their favorite memory of working with Clive? Okay, so um, my makeup was quite uh, brutal, as was Nick's, and um, very, very claustrophobic. And there was uh, one day that we'd been in the makeup a long time, and I found it very distressful, and we didn't get to be seen. Um, and it, the, the, the note came back that uh, we weren't going to get to shoot the scenes that we were in the makeup for that day. And um, I'd had a pretty bad day anyway because I'd lost my lines that day because I couldn't say them through the teeth. <laughs> and, and, then this, and so I sat in the makeup and sobbed. I started crying, but because the makeup was on, nobody knew. <laughs> and then Clive appeared with a bottle of Jack Daniel. <laughs> and that fixes everything. <laughs> and a straw. <laughs> Oh boy. That was my yeah. favorite. Yeah, my, my favorite moment. There was one mo one morning, um, and I wasn't feeling too well, and um, so I was sitting there, and Jen Wild Goose with, with, was with me. Now, of course, my fear was that I was going to vomit and you know, with the teeth in, and I was going to choke and die. <laughs> um, so Robin Vision came out um, by the side of the set and uh, said, "Are we here, Nick's not well?" And Jane said, no, I said, yeah, it's okay, we know, we're gonna, we'll get the teeth out and he'll be absolutely fine. And Robin said, no, no, leave them in. Bring, bring him up on set, because Clive wants to film him being sick. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a little unfair, but true. <laughs> you, you use the moments when they're presented to you. <laughs> I, I think in my own defense, this is a very, very cheap picture, as you know. It's a $900,000 movie. And so we had very, very limited uh, funds, frankly. The most elaborate funds went to Doug Bradley's makeup. Actually, that's not strictly true, I think, Doug. I think probably the strictest, it was probably the, it was Oliver, wasn't it, who, the, you know, the, the skin yeah, crank, who was probably even more expensive than you were, right? Probably, uh, probably worked more days, so probably yes. used more. Yeah. Uh, was, was, I mean... The, he the, passed away, by the way, I don't know if you knew that. Yes. Oliver just passed Oliver. away, unfortunately. He, yes. He was an amazing man. He was very, very thin. Oh. He chose him because he was very, very oh, thin. So yes, don't, true. Are you sure he, he, he was very ill? He, he's very ill. Yeah, he, he had had a serious heart attack. He's, he's, he's still with us. He's still he is. With us. I, 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 I won't, I won't oh, contest the point, okay. Um, I was only told that two weeks ago, so. Oh, yeah. Um, so, uh, I, I hope he's alive, let's hope he's alive. Yeah. Yes. I was told. Um, he, wa he is, was a very, very thin man, and because he had to have an entire la layer of skin put on him and still look skin, yes? So, and he was, and he smoked a lot, uh, 50 a day. And so uh, when, uh, when we came to the moment when he would be resurrected, we had a, a cut from his resurrection to his, uh, him being in his shirt and fully dressed. And he said, well, what do I do now? And I said, well, what would you do? And he said, I'd like a cigarette. <laughs> and if you look at the movie, that's exactly what he does. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, there are two, strictly speaking, ad libs in the movie, and that's one of them. Really? And the other yeah. one is uh, Jesus Wept, which oh, well, is yes. uh, the last, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the last lines Larry speaks, and uh, uh, rather Frank speaks, actually, Frank in Larry's skin. And that was, I actually talked to Andrew Robinson only three months ago, and I said, I never really asked you, why did, why did you say that? Why did you, what made you come up with that line? And he said, well, one thing it was short, and the other thing was, the line you'd give me was fucking awful. <laughs> <laughs> so, I thought, well, and so I, I always say that whenever I can, I tell that story simply because it's, I think it's a great line. I think it's a great line. It's a great way for somebody to sign off, mm, yeah. you know. And uh, I thought, what a, there could be no better way, in a way, to, uh, 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 to celebrate Andrew's, Andy's uh, creativity 
and I would hate to think that he would ever, uh, uh, I would ever take on my own account something that he had created on the spot, I should say. He said, I want to say something different, he said. And I think he was tied to the board that he was, he was being made up on and would eventually, you know, hang on for eight hours. And that's a long time to be on that board. Yeah, and, and he was there and he was pissed. I mean, he was so pissed. And I don't blame him. And I, I said to him, he said, I don't want to say this down line, it's dumb line. And I said, well, you know what, Andy? You've been here for eight hours. Say what the hell you like. And he said, okay, just run the camera. And uh, that, was, that was his last line. He just said, uh, Jesus, what? And what are you going to do? I mean, you can't improve on that. It's the shortest line in the Bible, and it's a good biblical quote. And, uh, and, and straight into, it went into the movie. And uh, I cannot take credit for it. It's Andy's. Yeah. Any other thoughts that while I'm here, I'm just going to pop in for 20 minutes and head well, out. Well, um, I'll, I'll, I'll pick out, I, I, I'm at a disadvantage because I've, I've worked with this reprobate for 50 years. <laughs> 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 So, you know, memories of, of sitting backstage listening to you wildly ad-libbing during the school play. Yeah, for sure. Um, to Is There Anybody There, in which Clive was playing a vicar reading the Jewish Chronicle upside down. Um, but if I come to Hellraiser, I'll go to an, an inadvertent mistake. One of the wonderful things about working with Clive is his on-the-spot enthusiasm. Because he always has ideas on the hoof. He thinks on his feet, and if something is working, he wants to push it to the limits. So when we were filming the scene of the Cenobites' first arrival in the hospital, yeah. um, firstly, I smoked then, so um, Clive thought it would be a great wheeze to make me wheeze. Um, uh, so before I, before I delivered the line, we'll tear your soul apart, um, I had a cigarette, and I'm on my mark, and I'm going... <laughs> we'll tear your soul apart. So the, the theory being all the smoke would come out. Clive then decided that he could uh, improve on this by putting a, a smoke machine between my feet <laughs> under my skirt. So I'm now standing with my legs apart with a smoke machine underneath my skirt, which is a novel experience for me. Um, uh, but one he's repeated often. Getting, <laughs> since then? Oh, every Sunday. Um, uh, getting increasingly lightheaded from all of this, but, and Clive's saying, this is wonderful, it's wonderful. It looks like you've come straight from the pits of hell and you're still, you're still burning, you're still smoking. We can smell the bitumen and the sulfur, it's wonderful. So uh, we did the scene, and then um, on my next filming day, I came in, and uh, Selwyn Roberts, the first AD, um, said, oh, uh, Doug, some bad news and some good news. The good news being that we were being paid by the day, so I was about to get an extra day's filming. Uh, the bad news, uh, is we're going to have to film the hospital scene again. And I said, oh, uh, why? And he said, well, you know the smoke machine gag? It looks as though you're on fire. <laughs> it, it, when we were watching the rushes, we were, it, it was like we were waiting for someone to run in from the side with a fire extinguisher and, and <laughs> hose you down. So it's, it's, it's a great idea of the pits of hell and the smell of sulfur that, in practical yeah, terms, it, didn't... It's funny you mentioned that thing about stuff coming up, because I think that, yes, I know, Simon, you couldn't be seen. And same for Nick. But uh, uh, performances are performances, and, and you, you, people, people's presences, even behind masks, change the mask, yes? I think one of the things which is underestimated about all of these four good people is that the job you have of projecting through a piece of latex, a thick piece of latex, is incredibly difficult. It is not just the way you perf you move around. Sometimes you can move your face. In Simon, in Nick's case, you couldn't even move your face. But the 
the threat, the the uh, the sense of danger you get from them. And Doug, uh, of course, had the advantage of having you know a move a movable face, but still was a, a lot of latex. How long did it take you to have that makeup put on? Uh, f early on, yeah, five or six hours. Yeah, because um, uh, Jeff and Roy were really kind of feeling their way with it. It's it sped up to three or four. But that meant you had to be on, time. on, you had to be in the studio at three to be on set at nine sort of thing? It, well, certainly on, I, on Hellbound, my, my memories are clearer. Yeah. Um, it was generally, I would get up at 3.30. Uh, I would get up at three to be picked up at 3.30 to be at Pinewood at four, because we were always assured that we were needed for the first shot of the day. And then you weren't used to have turned it two in the afternoon, right? By about six o'clock in the evening. <laughs> <laughs> Twas ever thus. So, yeah, so, yeah. So, it, but it was generally that that kind of time, four hours generally was a, was allowed. But, but uh, I'd rather have, have gone through those four hours than the shorter amount of time sure. <laughs> that Nick and Simon went through for the misery they were in once Nick, their makeup. Nick genuinely was going to vomit. I mean, I, you were very, very sick that day. Yeah. Very, very yeah, sick. Yeah. Uh, but the, the other thing to, to be said about all of this is we have CGI up the gizmo now, right? And I think we are the lesser for it, personally. It is inconceivable that there could ever be what these guys did uh, through a computer-generated image, in my opinion. And, and for me, the birth of Frank sequence oh, in the yeah. movie, oh, yeah. for me, yeah. is one of, uh, speaking objectively, yeah. as far as I can, is yeah. one of the most extraordinary sequences in horror movies. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And, um, I, I, if, 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 I, if I'm right, I've said this many times in Q&As, that it was basically improvised and thrown together on the hoof between sure. you and Bob Keane. Sure, we had 25,000 pounds to do it all in, and each shot was a different idea, a different gag. We had reversed meltdowns, yep. yes, remember yeah. those? So we had heaters on, the, on this wax, which would then form, appear to form, and we had, you know, straight gags like sticking arms to holes to the floor, and all, all this stuff with this. What did they call it? That super, super glue. It was not super gunk. It was that nasty stuff. Oh, we called it elephant cum. Yeah, we did. Call it elephant cum. <laughs> what the... Yeah, and who jumped off the elephant? I. And, I, I... <laughs> it was. A, it was a very, very happy elephant. I remember. Very happy elephant. <laughs> Uh, You've never seen an elephant smile. Uh, 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 but we, we did have a lot of a lot of a lot of it was wallpaper paste. I well, think was yeah, it? but there was Glue? a stuff. They had a stuff. They had a big vat of it. It really did look. Right. It was, um, no, it wasn't. It was actually. I it checked this. It, it I was, checked this the other day. It was. So yeah. uh, it was soap flakes and hot water. Okay. okay. I, 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 hot soap powder, soap flakes. Which is and what hot they make water. custard pies out of for the custard pie game. Is that right? Yeah. Oh. yeah. Mm. Do you speak from experience? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Pantomime. Yeah. That's, uh, that's amazing. See last night's cake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. No. Um, uh, butterball cake and yeah. die, and they plucked it out, and then he smudged it all over his face. It was <laughs> a moment of imaginative theater. But it was black icing, and it stained all over my face, <laughs> all over my hands, and everybody was too polite to say, you really need to go and sort that out, apart from Doug, who said... Actually, everybody was asking for pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Nice one. Nice. Simon, Simon said to me, have, have I got it all off? I said, um, there's a bathroom in there, if I were you. <laughs> the Fred Flintstone look, right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I genteelly removed Pinhead's nose, um, having picked it first with my little... Oh. Oh. And, um, and one tooth, and, and ate it very daintily. <laughs> oh, good. Um, I, I want to go back to the, to the point about handmade effects because I absolutely agree with this point. The, the, the great thing about, about that too is that if you and Bob had done that sequence the following day, yeah. it would have been slightly different Yeah, because you would have had different ideas, things would have worked in different days, yeah. in, in different ways, and it means 
that the special effects that you see in Hellraiser are unique. They're, they have a handprint, they're handmade, um, and they're markedly different from the special effects in A Nightmare on Elm Street or the, the special effects in, You're right. in um, An American Werewolf in London. The, You're right. The, the problem for me with CG, CGI, while it's a brilliant tool that allows filmmakers to do things that would otherwise simply be impossible, everything looks the same. Well, there's, a, there's another thing, though, and I am, as you all know, a technophobe. I, you know, I, I'm not very good with technology. So, um, for me, the idea that I can direct somebody who is in makeup, you can't direct something in CGI. You can actually uh, go to the technicians who are doing it for you, who are very often very, very brilliant men and women, and you can say, look, this is what I'm looking for. And next time you go in a week, they will have got an approximation of what you're looking for. And then you say, well, that isn't right and that isn't right. You cannot stand over them, uh, you know, for long weeks and days, because often you're still dealing with the shoot of the picture or you're cutting the picture or you're scoring the picture. So you have to trust them. And the vision that you have in your head is never quite what appears on the screen. And the great thing about uh, having uh, an actor in makeup, particularly if it's superlative makeup, as these gentlemen were, mm. and ladies, uh, is that you can, there's somebody, un, there's somebody in there, there's a human being in there, which means that the human being responds to the direction that you give them. I can say to Doug, look, let's play it down a little, let's play it up a little, let's be a little bit more uh, growly and, and, and dangerous, let's be a little bit more so subtle and, 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 and almost sexy about things. You can do all kinds of stuff you simply cannot do with CGI. I mean, uh, I'm working right now with a wonderful director called uh, Michael uh, Doherty, who did uh, Godzilla 2, yeah, yeah. Uh, who is a, a, dr a dream of a guy, and he, we're doing a, a television series of Nightbreed together. And Michael is directing, writing, directing, and I'm producing. And uh, he's a superb, superb creator, uh, and I had, of course, I should have realized that all of Godzilla would be CGI, and I don't know how the heck you get through that as, as a creator, mm -hmm. knowing that you're handing over almost everything. Uh, the, the Cenobites appeared first as drawings, which you guys saw, I think, yeah. right? Long before we actually made them as creations, so they were drawings first, and then they were maquettes, and we had you know, your faces were all, I remember Doug having his, his face cast, that was a terrible night, remember that stuff? So, you know, having the plaster put on you and all that stuff. Then you manage to build up an image and that, that image goes on you and then it's still Doug, it's still an actor. I've worked with Doug as an actor since he was 15, right? And School so, play in Liverpool. Absolutely. So I had had a long, by the time he made Hellraiser, it was 13, 14, 15 years later. And I, he, was, he was my best buddy. And so I could talk to him through all that makeup and say, look, let's go back to what we know as each other as friends, as best buddies, and let's make sure that that, that comes through. I think that they're gonna make some more Hellraiser movies, I think, and unfortunately, I think a lot of it's gonna be CGI. And I say unfortunately, not because it, it cannot be brilliant, because sometimes it can be brilliant, but sometimes it can seem dead in the water. And I, I will always, and I will always advocate actors above, if it's possible. I would say, obviously, it can't be Godzilla, but but you can advocate an actor because an actor is a human being, and in the end, a monster is only good to the extent that they are human. Was I, that was uh, was that a fight that you had on Hellraiser? Because presumably, it would have been easier no, no. to no, but to to put um, extras in the makeup and then employ a voiceover artist. After. We had a that was a first. That was the first fight because I, I not only was I not uh, uh, wanting to hire a another, I was hiring my friends, mm -hmm. right? And in the first movie, it was actually my cousin who played Barbie's role. So I was going, uh, you know. Here are three of my, well, now four of my, but in that first movie, three of my best buddies. And I was going to them because firstly, the movie was being made for nothing and I knew they would trust me to do my best with it. It was my first You movie. knew we were cheap, is that what you 
<laughs> you know, I, I wrote and directed that movie for 19,000 pounds. Looking back on it, 19,000 pounds to write and direct it. And at one point, uh, they told me that uh, it hit $33 million worldwide. And I thought, 19,000 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but when you look back, I would not, uh, this is the thing they know, and I'm sure there's a lot of people out there, you're gonna make movies eventually, and the thing they always know about you with your first movie is, you do it for nothing. They know that. They know that you are so eager to do this, right? That whatever, whatever they need to pay you, however they need to insult you, they will, and then eventually, you'll say, hey, whatever it is, whatever it is. And I remember it was two in the morning we eventually did the deal uh, with, uh, with Nick Lom, the de our, our lawyer. Uh, we did the deal in LA. And I, I said to Nick, how am I a joy of being paid? $19,000 to write and direct. Um, you look wow. back on it and I think, you know what? They gave me the chance to do it. They gave us yes. all the yeah, chance yeah. to oh, do God, it. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, and here we are 31 years later, yeah? And, uh, and here are you. Thir 33 since 30 we shot the movie. Yeah, 33, yeah. 1986. The life of Christ, 33 years. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I just came in to interrupt you and say hello to you and tell you I love you all and thank you for being here. I will leave you with these good people. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a story of, of my first brush with prosthetic makeup, um, no pun intended, um, which was at the hands of Clive. Uh, way, way, way back, this goes back into days when we were still in Liverpool, we did a production um, of Oscar Wilde's Salome, his play of Salome, uh, and I was playing, uh, Clive was playing King Herod, and uh, I was playing uh, Yochanan, John the Baptist, who is blind. Uh, so Clive got paper mache, toilet paper and wallpaper paste, and paper mache over the upper part of my uh, head and face, uh, creating sockets which he was then able to fill with gunge and blood and bits of wool that were hanging down my face to be bits of tendon uh so that was that was yeah. my f and of course the end result of that you was were blind. That i was completely blind and, and you were led a uh, around by a piece of uh, rope uh, uh, not around my neck right <laughs> 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 it was uh, yes round, round my waist and tied off to the back of the stage um, so you couldn't so get away. I wouldn't wander off into the audience. But you know, what's, what's, what's interesting is, I, I, I had completely forgotten that. And what, what age were we when we did that? Oh, Christ. Uh, well, if you say, say so. Uh, no. How, it, how old were we? Well, we're st I think we're still around a school. 15, 16. I mean, are we barely... 15, like, 16. When did we do... Is there anybody there? <laughs> I, I, yeah, probably about 16 or 17. What's interesting Not many is, of you know Clive wrote a Whitehall farce. The, the, there are, but what's interesting is that the tradition followed on into you, you guys. I mean, yeah. uh, in other words, you yeah. weren't the first blind actors I knew. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was a theme. I, 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 yeah, it was a theme. And, and uh, trust me, I would never do it again. So next time I'm hiring you, I promise you, no, 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 no more blind actors. <laughs> thank you. My friends, I, I have to go, but I just wanted to say hi to you and thank you. And I'll see you next time. Ladies and gentlemen, please. Big round of applause for Clive Parker. Ladies and gentlemen, Clive Barker.
honestly did not know that was happening. <laughs> I asked Dave. I said, yeah. I said, I've, I've, I've heard a rumor client's going to join us. Dave said, no, absolutely not. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I, I had tried. Go ahead. Can, can I just say one thing, although Clive and I didn't work together in Hellbound Hellraiser 2? Getting emotional. I feel very privileged to have been able to enter into this extraordinary world. And I didn't want to go to the audition for this film because the first film scared the out of me, you know? So, I don't, on Cenobites, what were they? I've never seen a monster like that. And here's the genius of Clive Barker. Not only had he created these incredibly scary monsters, you know, a new monster, he also created something that was really iconic. And still, I signed a bunch of them today, and it's the Lament Configuration. And you, that's two unique things that are in this story, just one of his many brilliant stories. So I wanted to say as well that nothing's things have rarely wasted with Clive. If something doesn't quite go right, he will put it away in his mind for something else that's going to get used. Mm. So the eye things, he's, he's used again, but also the smoke thing. The whole thing of filling you up with smoke and looking like you're on fire. When we did Night Breeze, um, and my character was going to go on fire, yeah, yeah, yeah. before each take, I had a guy coming in and filling my pantaloons up with smoke. <laughs> uh, so he... he put that away in his brain and thought, okay, guy on fire, that's what we'll do next time if we ever get to that. And it's exactly what he did. And did it work that time? Yes, it... no, it did, because I was supposed to look like I was yeah. on fire. I meant to say to Clive, of course, reshooting the hospital scene also meant he got to uh, write Kirsty's boyfriend out of the scene. <laughs> he also that's, seems... that's another discussion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he also seems to like to put things all over your face. <laughs> It sounds I, like I try not he to likes take to cover your face. <laughs> <laughs> John, weren't you offered another role like, as well? Or wasn't it either the moving man? Oh, or the... God, no. No. What? No, oh, God. God. Wait, wait. Oh, no I'm sorry. This is what I heard. I've answered so. this before. Um, <laughs> Once in an interview a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far, oh, right. fucking far. <laughs> um, Clive always intended I would play Pinhead when, and I'd been talking to Clive on that basis and, and so forth um, and when Chris Fig called me and said uh, now is the time we need to start talking turkey um, there's Pinhead there is one other part available which is the mattress delivery guy if I could take anything back, it would be the point in this interview where I said, this is true. There was a moment where I th thought, thinking purely as an actor, Hellraiser was my first movie, and I'm thinking purely, well, maybe, if I'm going to be in this movie, it would be a good idea if people can see my face. So mm -hmm. if I'm going to auditions and people say, what have you done lately? I can say, blah, 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 blah. And they'll, they'll oh, yeah, yeah, of course we remember you as the mattress removal guy. <laughs> and I had that thought in my head. Well, there was never any doubt in my mind, actually, that I was going to play Pinhead, nor there was, was there any, ever any serious discussion of me playing the mattress removal guy. Uh, but that, this has followed me around for 30 years. <laughs> and I brought it up. Now even, now even, so sorry. Now even my fellow actors are, are accusing me of it. Uh, but it, but um, um, none of it's true. Of course, the role of the, the, the memorable role of the mattress removal guy went to uh, another actor who had worked for a long time with Clive in the dog company, the theater company that we had prior to Hellraiser happening, Ollie Parker, who then reprised his role as the mattress removal guy <laughs> in, in Hellbound, and then played Peliquin in Nightbreed. Oh. Uh, and, and, and is now a, 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 a director of merit um, in his own right. Um, if, uh, um, uh, so 
tangled, tangled webs weaving there. I was going to say something else, but I've lost my thread. It might come back to me. Carry on. Uh, and, and, and another repeating, Clive has repeating themes, and I played the mattress removal man in the Book of Blood. There you go. It's, yeah, there's a lot of mattress removal men <laughs> <laughs> in, in Clive's films. Yeah, I think possibly I wouldn't be sitting here answering questions about my performance as the mattress removal. <laughs> Maybe, possibly. Thank you so much for clarifying. Oh, <laughs> speaking, speaking of, speaking of um, act, fellow actors and um, particularly actresses, have, have you seen the, um, the clip on YouTube, YouTube of uh, Imogen Borman talking about us getting hooked on painkillers? What? What? No. Where? There is, there, there, is a, there is a film clip in which she is being, she's being interviewed by somebody about Hellraiser. And she says to camera, oh, I know they had such a terrible time with the makeup in the, in the first film, uh, and, the, and particularly the costumes, which was so uncomfortable. They were in, they were in serious pain with back trouble. Um, and uh, and uh, in, in, indeed, Doug is still addicted to painkillers to this day. Doug, you were. Well, that's what she said. No, she's getting confused. It's Grace. I don't, I'm not saying that Grace... I think it's, it was Grace, me, yeah. She had, yeah, she had back issues, and I don't think she got hooked on painkillers. Don't get me wrong, Grace is not a drug addict, as far as I'm aware. But the only person I know who did have terrible trouble with her back was Grace, because... Well, actually, because I, I still But I think that was pre-existing. I think she had scoliosis yes, she had or something like that. Yeah. The yeah. costume was designed to take into account right. her back pain. And, uh, you know, I was, I think maybe one of the reasons I got the part, other than being a professional mime, was that I might have fit her costume. And so when they were um, drawing the laces in, it was pulling my lower back. And I started getting really bad pain, back pain, um, uh, because of it. But, you know, I was fairly spry. And so once I stopped having to be this corset, you know, twisting me a bit. It was, it was a minor thing, and I certainly didn't get addicted to painkillers, so I'm not quite sure where that came from. No, well, I, no, but it's it's out on YouTube now, so... Oh, great! <laughs> oh, sorry. Right. It it's can't be taken back. <laughs> it must be true. Yeah. Okay, we're going to take, uh, take a couple more questions right here. Well, as one of the writers of those comics uh, you're talking to, because I think I did, I contributed about half a dozen stories to the original Hellraiser comics. Um, I like the idea of the. Um, that's, it's, it, um, hard question to answer when your voice is going particularly. Um, I like the Guardians of the Box. I've always been kind of fascinated by the guardians of the box, of the, of the puzzle boxes. You know, in the first film, he's the trampy guy who then becomes the flying thingy guy. What I, I never quite understood. Um, so I, I, yeah, I, do, I, I think that to be kind of interesting. Um, I, the backstories of the Cenobites. Um, I Barbie's said, you know, she's Barbie and I have both written backstories. Um, most recently, I've written a backstory for Chatterer called Prayers of Desire. Um, so how, just how did a 12-year-old boy end up in hell? Um, so I think there's so much stuff that you could you go in and explore. So yeah, Guardians of the Boxes particularly I'd like to explore. Uh, I, 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 the Scarlet Gospels that Clive wrote, uh, with the, the big battle that Pinhead has with the, uh, the political struggles of hell, <laughs> I think that would be really, really interesting to see. And also oh, because God. that has come from Clive's imagination as well. Um, and, but it would have to be with Doug, obviously. We might have, we might have, seen, we might have seen more of that. In Hellbound, if, if we hadn't lost the chunk of the budget, you know, there was the idea of Leviathan. 
Oh, yeah. Which Pete picks up in Hellraiser 3. He has Pinhead saying, my God was diamond and black light. That's the only time we hear Pinhead make reference to a God who was any kind of hierarchical superior to him. Uh -huh. We see that diamond briefly in that glass shot. Um, in, oh Christ, I wish Clive was still here to, I mean, we talk about not using C CGI, there's a, there's a good old-fashioned glass painting shot uh -huh. in, in, uh, in Hellbound. But because th there was a financial crisis, Black Thursday or Orange Tuesday or whatever it was called, and it, and it meant that because of the shift in the exchange rates, um, uh, which happened just as the budget was about to be transferred from Los Angeles to London, one third of the budget was wiped away. And New World couldn't make up the slack. So uh, uh, as far as I'm aware, there was even talk about postponing the picture mm -hmm. because they were so worried about it, but they decided to go ahead. So a lot of stuff got, uh, got yeah. removed. And I think we would have explored some of those ideas. There was, I think, wasn't there an idea of a machine in in the depth down there that was spitting out cenobites, creating yeah, the cenobites. engineer and yeah. Um, I am um, I, I I think I always felt I would like to have explored more the angels demons dichotomy. We tend to, as the series go on, land heavily on the demon side, which I think is a bit of a lazy assumption that develops about the nature of Pinhead and who he is. And there's a, there's a beat right at the beginning of uh, Hellraiser, after, w w actually the first time we see Pinhead, after Frank has been pulled to bits, Frank in Larry's skin has been pulled to bits, we see that at the beginning of the film, Pinhead makes his way through the chains and then he puts the jigsaw of uh, Larry's face back together in the, in the blood, he moves the pieces of skin and it always struck me that that's an almost childlike uh, thing of playing and of wanting to to reconstruct the human being out of out of the destruction that he's been responsible for with the hooks and the chains and that 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 always seemed to me it's almost frank it's almost like frankenstein isn't it frankenstein mm. putting his yes. monster together yeah. yeah um i just want to um say that I obviously would like to explore the more feminine angles of the story and, you know, the female Cenobite side. But I, I, are we nearly? Yeah, we're, we're I, gonna take one last question. Can I then. ask a question? Sure. Okay, guys, what are you up to next? <laughs> oh, don't ask that. Let, 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 let. <laughs> I've only got one more question. Yeah, go okay, on. okay. Okay, we'll go right over here. Yep. Um, yeah, well, let me, uh, where to begin? Hell, Hellraiser 3 was going to have an entirely rock soundtrack. Um, and in fact, I, I got a phone call at one point. They were going to put a Hellapalooza tour together. All the bands that were contributing, including Nine Inch Nails, wow. um, were going to go out on tour, and they wanted me to go out on tour with it and MC it. And fuck, it never happened. Um, <laughs> the only... Uh, then they changed their minds and put an orchestral score on it, not Chris Young, sadly. Um, and the only song that survived was Hellraiser, which was written by Ozzy. Um, Ozzy, for some reason, decided he didn't want to record it. Lemmy got it. Lemmy said he, he wanted to do it and wanted to do the video on condition that Pinhead was in it and Clive directed it. So I, I rolled, we, we shot in a, in a condemned theater in downtown LA and I arrived in, in a stretch limo and got out and um, here on the sidewalk, we weren't allowed to smoke inside the building, here on the sidewalk is Lemmy. Um, and he immediately greeted me and I bummed a cigarette from him and that was my introduction to Lemmy, was standing, standing on an LA street uh, 
um, at 10 o'clock in the morning uh, smoking a cigarette. Um, and then we, we, we came to the scene where Lemmy and Pinhead play cards and he plays the ace of spades to win and loses his soul and blah, blah, blah. So we sat across this card table and we discovered that we had a great love of classic British comedy, particularly British radio comedy, um, from the goons on down. And he had a, an almost perfect recall of these things and round the horn and none of this means any to, anything to most of you but we sat and traded what we could remember of this there was a flagon over here it was a, a glass thing it was empty and I could see as we were talking Lemmy kept looking at, at this um, and he, he had a word with his people and the flagon was taken away and shortly after that it came back filled with amber liquid. Um, and while the Prince of Darkness um, sat and demurely sipped his Evian water on one side um, <laughs> of the table, Lemmy made his way through the entire flagon of amber liquid, like you and I might drink orange juice. Um, uh, by about 11 o'clock at night, he was just beginning to, you know, if he got up from his chair, there would be a moment of, <laughs> of that. But, um, uh, you know, and then I went and sat in the stalls and watched Motorhead play Hellraiser. So I'll take that. It was a pretty cool day. Okay, uh, what we'll do, if, if you guys wouldn't mind, if you could uh, let the fans, if you could stand up maybe and let the fans take a couple photos of you as a group. We can do that. <laughs> <laughs> too late for that now. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm about to late. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, please a big round of applause for Barbie Wilde, Nicholas Vince, Simon Bamford, and Doug Bradley, the Hellraiser reunion.